Well, well, Tom, looks like you're having a good day. We're having a good day, a good year, and a, a, a terrific time out, out west. <laughs> it's really, it's $710.5 million from Bezos. I think this is the largest uh, single gift to a cancer center um, from a single source. That The largest would have been Phil Knight, and that would have been half a billion. And Paul, what I what I can say is I think this gift reflects the sense uh, that the Bezos family has about bringing urgency to cancer and to infectious diseases. And they want to accelerate the pace and scale of our research at the Fred Hutch. And I think that's the reason that drove uh, their generosity in this sense. Mm -hmm. But you're actually talking about three billion uh, that over the next 10 years, well, I think when you look at uh, the need is enormous in cancer, when you look at, um, uh, when I look at, at how we're going to cure cancer, and, and, and Paul, I've had the chance to work in great hospitals and universities in the country. I've had the chance to be the chief scientific officer of Bristol Myers Squibb. I've served on boards of biotech. So I've, I've been able to see multiple parts of the cancer ecosystem. And um, pharma does a spectacular job of developing products and drugs that make a difference for people. And biotech is terrific at proving principles, but yet the generous, the, the source of ideas, the true source of innovation that drives cures and cancer comes from cancer centers. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're so delighted to see this show of faith in us from the Bezos family, because we believe that the ideas that can come from this can make a huge difference. Now, the question you might ask is why 3 billion? 3 billion is the number, when I look at over a 10 year period, what I think we need to do to be able to fuel research broadly across cancer. And Paul, that number is not out of uh, comparison to what our peer cancer institutes plan to do in their uh, ambition across the country. I think if you go to any of the top 10 cancer centers, I think all of them have plans to be able to try to do um, uh, efforts in that range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, three billion doesn't strike me as an insane amount of money, but but that number is, came out of your. It came out of our assessment of where the Fred Hutch is now, and where I'd like to see the Fred Hutch get to. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, we are a spectacular center uh, for the treatment of patients with leukemia, lymphoma. We are a cutting edge center in in um, cell therapies uh, for hematologic malignancies. What I would like to see is I would like to see our center be able to develop those same innovations in lung cancer, pancreas cancer, colorectal cancer, bladder cancer. And I think that those kinds of innovations are gonna take that kind of work. And together with our partners at UW Medicine, um, we really are working to create this on the clinical side. Now the Hutch is the research engine and the outpatient clinical, as we talked about before, UW Medicine is our inpatient partner for this. And so we're looking to be able to do that. You know, I think one of the other things, Paul, that was interesting about this is the Bezos family saw what we did with COVID and saw the role that the Hutch played in the response to COVID and that ability to go from, uh, from ideas to development of vaccines um, uh, here was, I think, something that was really important to them. And again, I think help to fuel a, a belief that we can get, we can achieve these kinds of things in cancer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I saw that most of the money um, uh, that you're planning to spend is going to be on recruitment. Yes. Uh, so the uh, so the 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 way we look at the money is there's there's basically several several buckets. The first bucket is for creating a research environment. So we have a building uh, plan, a new building that we're putting together for uh, precision oncology, and a, a, a large amount of the, of the gift will go to, to that building fund uh, to be able to create a new research environment for people that integrates data science and experimental laboratories um, on this campus of the Fred Hodgson. So we're very much looking forward to that. The second is talent. I mean, when you look at what scientists need, talent's a big part of it. A research environment is also a big part of it. So yes, a, lot, a large amount of this is for recruitment and retention of the very best faculty. Paul, I think there's a crisis right now in cancer research. Some of our finest minds are leaving, 
their PhD programs or their cancer fellowships, and they're going into industry, uh, which is certainly their choice, but we're losing some of the most creative minds because we don't have the resources to recruit and retain the very best minds in cancer research. And I want those people to stay in academia where they can develop ideas that can lead to innovation. So that's why recruitment and retention is such a big part of this package. Also enabling technologies are important. And that's what, what the third part of it goes to. So clinical trial innovations. And can we look at ways of enhancing the clinical trial system so that it doesn't take an average of, of four to six months to open a clinical trial. And so that we're able to get genomic sequencing done on patients, not just of the cancer itself, but of the microbiome of the uh, patient's immune uh, repertoire in terms of what they bring to the tumor, uh, or what they bring to their disease. This comprehensive profiling will also be part of the clinical trial approach that we're gonna be looking at. Well, let's talk about re recruitment and retention and maybe even funding because, you know, uh, what's the point of giving somebody a, a, a good startup salary or its start startup package uh, when they're not going to ever get uh, a, um, an NIH grant because of, look at the pay lines. Uh, before Harold Varmus sort of in his final stage as the NI NCI director, talked about maybe staff scientists or maybe something closer to a uh, St. Jude model where you don't necessarily go to raise money elsewhere. Is that, are you thinking about that uh, or are you thinking about more traditional approach? So I'm thinking about more traditional approaches, but there's no doubt that staff scientists, and we have lots of terrific staff scientists here at the Fed Hutch. Um, but I do think that most of this recruitment is going to go toward standard assistant professors, associate professors, and full professors. And Paul, it's not just for new people. It's faculty support, but it's not just for new people. People who are here working in basic science at the Fred Hutch, working in virology, working in cancer biology, working in human biology, these areas will all be areas of investment. And I, I you know, we've got an excellent track record of our faculty getting funding. But as you know, Paul, the funding from the NIH only covers about 70% of the cost of doing research. In fact, in some cases, it's even less than 70% of the cost of doing research. And philanthropy is a huge way that we close that gap um, between the true cost of doing research and what the, what the, and the NIH grants support. Mm -hmm. And this becomes, I think, a really important investment. Too much talent is leaving academic medicine, cancer centers, and universities. We need to do better retaining people and creating an environment where they can be successful. How do you do that? How do you expect to do that? Are you going to try to do something that nobody else is doing? Because this is, there's, there's, if you're recruiting a lot, you, you kind of have to throw in something unusual, I would think. Well, I think there's, I think that, you know, that, that, that you look at each, each recruit is its own independent uh, story in terms of what they bring to the table in terms of what their needs are uh, to be successful. I think that the you want to make sure that people feel they um, have an environment that's going to be supportive of them, that's going to allow them to be able to accomplish what they want to in the laboratory. In a city like Seattle, which is a remarkably dynamic and, and explosive creative place, I mean, it's not a shock that Amazon, Microsoft, and, and, uh, and Costco all came uh, out of Seattle. I mean, it's not a shock that these kind of, that this kind of innovation happens here. And I think this is very much a Seattle story. I think that, that the, the fact that the Bezos family has been supporting us for so long, they've been involved for nearly two decades um, in the Fred Hutch. And this became a chance for them to really invest in a way that I think is going to be able to, to show tremendous rewards and, and tremendous impact here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And this is not a naming gift. This is just... No, like the, the, the Bezos family was very clear this was not about naming. Um, in fact, they encouraged us to, to work with other donors to find naming opportunities uh, for different facilities. And as you know, um, we were very fortunate to raise a gift that we, report, that we uh, reported a month ago um, from Molly and Stuart Sloan uh, to raise $78 million uh, to support precision oncology efforts uh, here at the Fred Hutch. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so I guess uh, I, I I guess there must be some backstory here. You must have been talking with uh, with the family quite a bit to get yeah, that. So the reality of what happened is that the Bezos family's been involved for 
quite some time. They've been involved for, for nearly uh, 18 years um, in the Hutch. Uh, they first visited us in 2004. And Mike and Jackie Bezos have been extremely motivated to be part of, of our center. Um, and they've supported a number of initiatives uh, over the years. And their most notable initiative um, was supporting immunotherapy research at the Fred Hutch. I believe it's they've given $68 million in support for different things prior to this. Um, so mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in 2017, they gave us $35 million to create an integrated immunotherapy research center, which is called the Bezos Center um, here at the Fred Hutch, which is both clinical and, um, and research. And uh, so they've been involved with us. So when I came to the Hutch two and a half years ago, I uh, began discussions with them and, and talked about trying to learn what was most important to them, um, what they were most interested in. And it turned out this was the, these were the areas that they wanted to see um, uh, investments made and that resonated with them the both resonated with them the most. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just uh, since you've seen research, cancer research from many venues, as you pointed out, of course, uh, and is there any way that cancer centers can do it better or differently than they've been doing it? Is there any kind of a, I, I'm not going to suggest hybridization because when you hybridize a cancer center with a, with industry, you get industry, yes. but, 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 but is there a, is there a way you're thinking about it? That's kind of more kind of overall. You, you want to try to create a center where the scientist's time is spent focused on science and not focused on, on academic, academic uh, uh, administrivia, I might say. Um, and I think one of the things we're really trying to do with the Hutch, and there's other centers around the country that I hope we're trying to do this as well, is allow our scientists to focus on their science. Because I believe deep down that the people who are truly innovators, the people who are truly have the vision um, to see where cancer goes, do best in an academic environment where there's no constraints on their thought, no constraints on where the research goes. They're not doing research to prove a principle so that a biotech company can raise its next series of funding. They're not in pharma trying to develop a product to be able to bring to patients. And remember, both of those missions are incredibly important. And without those missions, we don't cure cancer either. But at a place like the Hutch, we've got to have people who are unconstrained in their thinking, unconstrained in their vision, who can think about how do I approach this cancer? How do I learn more about it? What's the next best experiment I can do? And, and those kinds of people, I think will ultimately thrive. Many of those people have tried to go to industry and tried to go to pharma, and they've never been as happy as they were in academia. But you've got to, in academia, give them the tools to think big and not have them feel constrained by the politics of a department or the politics of a of a hospital or a center that can slow them down. Mm -hmm. Well, you've you've changed uh, the structure recently. Is that in any way related to that? Or? Yes, I think I think what we did at the Fred Hutch was um, together with our partners at UW Medicine, University of Washington. Um, mm -hmm. We um, we um, uh, uh, we we merged the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance into the Fred Hutch. So now it's the Fred Hutch Cancer Center. This has allowed some streamlining and, um, and, and um, uh, uh, increase in our throughput and the ability to do clinical trials better. And again, it's infused by this sense of urgency of how critical it is for us to make these kinds of progress, make this kind of progress. So um, by bringing together the SCCA, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance with the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, we believe we have the right structure on the clinical and clinical research side to make a difference. The laboratory side really did not change much. We have laboratories obviously at U University of Washington and we have laboratories here at the Fred Hutch, but it's, um, so, so those have always existed and those have always done very well. Seattle Cancer Care Alliance is kind of a, uh, uh, an artifact from days long gone. I mean, this is what, this is what Bob Day had to do. So yes. he, he did it. <laughs> So yeah, what about diversity, disparities, uh, population research? Is any how is that going to be affected by what you're doing? So when I think about the key pillars that this supports, this supports all of the science at the Fred Hutch. It supports the science in population science and prevention. 
It supports basic science. It supports um, clinical trials and thinking about how we can bring clinical trials more equitably to our population across the Hutch. So by supporting all of the scientific themes of the Fred Hutch, this gift is going to have quite broad impact in terms of what we're doing. And I'm incredibly excited about this. As you know, the Fred Hutch has been a place where diversity, equity, and inclusion have been very important. We just completed a, a cluster hire, which brought eight uh, uh, um, new scientists to the Fred Hutch. Um, and, um, and, and these new scientists have helped us uh, triple the diversity of our assistant professor pool um, here at the Hutch. And so this is something that's important and this is something that will continue. And the, uh, the Bezos gift is going to help uh, promote uh, science throughout the entire center. Prevention, all the way to, to primary molecular science, all the way to clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And catchment area, right? You could. Yeah, so our catchment area, we also increased since I've been here. Um, our new yeah. submission to the, to the NCI that we plan to submit in about a year, year and a half. Our catchment area is now defined as the state of Washington, not just Puget Sound. And I think one of the things as an East Coast guy coming out here and realizing the opportunity um, to be able to look at how we care for cancer in rural areas, a big part of Washington state is made up of rural towns and being able to reach out um, to look at prevention services and screening services in more remote parts of the state will be an important part of what the Fred Hutch is working on. Mm -hmm. What about Alaska? You were we were talking about the NCI allows you to have an, an area outside your catchment area that's an area of special focus. And for us, I would say that's Alaska and it's Uganda are the two areas that we oh. at as special focus. And uh, Alaska is a spectacular place, as you know. More than half the healthcare in Alaska is provided through the uh, through the uh, Native uh, Native American healthcare system um, that's present there. Um, and we look forward to working more closely with Alaska uh, in the future as we move forward, being able to increase clinical trial opportunities um, uh, in, in parts of Alaska. We look at that as important to our mission. Well, is there anything we've missed? Anything I forgot to ask? I, I, think, the, I think, again, it comes down to, to one of the things that matters a lot to the Bezos family is collaboration. And I think one of the things when you pointed out that you know, we did, re did this restructure with, uh, with the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, what I think struck them was this idea that we're creating a more collaborative environment for science. And that sense of collaboration was really critical to them in, 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 in getting them interested in, in making this kind of commitment. And they're also impressed by our collaborations with other cancer centers across the country. And, and I think, you know, Paul, as someone who studied uh, cancer research as long as you have, um, I think one of the points that I'm sure is not lost on you is how important our collaborations are across centers. And, you know, I had a discussion with the Bezos family and I said to them, I said, you know, I said, after this happens, I said, one of the things I'd be thrilled about is if this gift was matched or exceeded, I said, in Boston, in New York, in Dallas, in LA. Um, and that would be a spectacular example of your generosity really being a call to arms for people across the country in terms of what's needed, because we still have enormous needs nationally if we're going to make a difference in how cancer is researched and how cancer is cared for. How Do you have an idea of how you're going to get to the three billion mark? So it's a 10-year campaign. Uh, one of the things I'll say about Seattle is the people in Seattle have been extremely successful in many different business, business ventures. Um, and so we're going to work very, very hard uh, to be able to get to that number and uh, to make a very strong case that, that health matters. Cancer is something which there is, and again, Paul, this is your career as well. You know, there is, there is no disease that has the same impact, magnitude, and, and worry that cancer uh, presents to people. And I think I've been always impressed, whether I've been at Yale or whether I've been at, at Mass General, how motivated grateful patients and people who've been financially successful have been to help support medical research and cancer research in general. So we're very optimistic and we look forward to having the discussions with the people to, to be able to get the support there. Well, well, thank you so much. Uh, good luck with this. This is going to be amazing. Thank you, Paul.